I think, uh, I think that everyone will agree that the, the previous panel that we, we just had that was uh, beautifully moderated by Leroy Chow was really spectacular. And uh, this panel uh, deals with the uh, important risk of radiation. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator, who's uh, Graham Scott. For those of you who don't know, uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, Graham in our community. He's a military pilot, formerly with uh, the New Zealand Air Force, and he's a physical chemist by training, studied with uh, Robert Curl, who's a Nobel laureate here at Rice University. Uh, he worked on the Human Genome Project, and then went off to industry for 10 years, and we're really fortunate to have recruited him as the associate director and the chief scientist of NSBRI. So, Graham? Great. Thank you, Jeff, for those uh, generous remarks. And uh, Mr. Abbey has given me instructions that we, we need to wrap this up in about 45 minutes, I believe. So it's going to put us about, sorry, Mr. Abbey, 45 minutes? Sounds good? OK. So right, right around 2.15, we need to be done. Um, I will say a few brief remarks, and then I'll introduce the panel, and then each panelist will have somewhere between five to seven minutes, and that should allow us a little bit of time for questions. So uh, projecting a vision for space ra radiobiological research necessitates understanding the nature of the space radiation environment how radi and how radiation risks influence mission planning, timelines and operational decisions. Exposure to space radiation increases the risks of astronauts developing cancer, experiencing central nervous system decrements, exhibiting degenerative tissue effects or developing acute radiation syndromes. One or more of these deleterious health effects could develop during future multi-year space exploration missions beyond low Earth orbit. Shielding is, of course, an effective countermeasure against solar particle events, but it is ineffective in protecting crew members from the biological impacts of fast-moving, uh, highly charged galactic cosmic radiation. Astronauts traveling on a protracted voyage uh, to Mars may be exposed to solar particle, event radi uh, solar particle events um, overlaid on a more predictable flux of galactic cosmic rays. Uh, therefore, ground-based research studies employing model organisms uh, seeking to accurately mimic the biological effects of the space radiation environment should uh, consider concatenating exposures to both protons as well as heavy ions. New techniques in genomics, proteomics, metabolomics and other omics areas um, should also be considered for employment and correlated with phenotypic observations. These types of 21st century approaches may help in more precisely elucidating the effects of space radiation on humans and aid in developing personalized radiological countermeasures for astronauts. So with those comments as a backdrop, let me now briefly introduce uh, each of our panelists. Firstly, uh, Dr. Marianne Burma. Dr. Burma is an, an associate professor uh, at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. She's also uh, the director of the NSBRI-funded Center for Space Radiation Research. Uh, sitting uh, to her immediate right, we have Dr. Keith Sengel, physician uh, and associate professor of radiation oncology at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania um, in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, sitting to uh, Dr. Sengel's right, uh, Dr. Bernard Rabin, professor within the Department of Psychology at the University of Maryland. And uh, then uh, we have our two Russian colleagues. Uh, firstly, uh, Dr. Vladimir Sichov, the deputy director of, uh, one of the deputy directors of the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Moscow, Russia. And then um, academician uh, Igor Ushakov, the director of the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Moscow, Russia. So as I already mentioned, I will ask uh, each speaker to state uh, what they would like to highlight in regards to recent radiation advances and how they overlay on some of the risks that we've been talking about um, over the last day or so. Um, please keep your remarks fairly concise. Um, around five minutes would be ideal, and that will allow us some time for questions. So with that, um, Dr. Burma, would, would you like to get us started? Sure. So first off, uh, before I start, I wanted to, to mention that after today's presentation on dark matter, followed by this very fascinating panel of astronauts and cosmonauts, I feel very humbling to be next up. All I do is study radiation, ionizing radiation, but I'll do my best to 
give a few remarks uh, in, a, in a short period of time. So I'm a radiation biologist from background with an interest in cardiovascular effects of ionizing radiation. And with and the help of NSBRI and with a team of investigators from four universities, we are set out in the coming years to try and characterize the risks of mainly from exposure to galactic cosmic rays that occurs when you travel beyond a low Earth orbit. Um, and so the, the, um, they're degenerative. These are, are mainly called degenerative tissue effects. So they could cause a long-term, a late after exposure degeneration of, of tissues and, and organs. Um, there may also be some acute effects that may occur from most, mostly from exposure to protons from solar particle events. And uh, Dr. Singel, I'm sure, will talk about that because his team has done a tremendous work in the last couple of years uh, characterizing those effects. I'll mainly focus on these, uh, these degenerative effects that may occur from exposure to, to GCR. Now, first off, degenerative effects could happen in any organ or tissue. So you have to first of prioritize which organs or, or tissues may be mostly at risk, and then which ones could really affect uh, function or, or your, your health uh, short term or long term. And in the last couple of years, there has become a concern uh, has come up as um, one of the organ systems that may be at risk from exposure to GCR is the cardiovascular system. Now, why is that? That is because in the last decade or so, um, more and more studies have come out on populations, uh, people who were exposed to low doses of ionizing radiation here on Earth. So it is mostly, for instance, in A-bomb survivors. They've been followed for many decades now. And what they've shown is that in these A-bomb survivors, there's an increased rate in some cardiovascular disease. Ischemic, ischemic heart disease is shown, a hypertension and stroke, for instance, goes up. And this has recently been confirmed in other populations that have been exposed to low doses of radiation, for instance, in, med in medical situations or occupational exposure. So this has raised a concern about the cardiovascular response potentially uh, to uh, exposure to heavy ions due to uh, GCR. Now, how do you study that? That's very difficult because we have we have no real situation here. So we need to uh, model this, all of this, on Earth. Um, first off, what I want to mention is ionizing radiation in itself does not always have to be bad. I mean, we can't think, okay, there's exposure to radiation, so we're going to have adverse effects. Ionizing radiation, especially sometimes at low doses, are even uh, considered to be uh, beneficial. So if you, for instance, think about the bathhouses that um, were uh, very popular, especially in Europe in the last few centuries, where people would go because they, uh, they over there in those bathhouses, they were exposed to natural sources of, so radioactive materials, natural sources of ionizing radiation. So they would go there regularly and it would be great in um, solving some of their, their skin problems, their infectious diseases. So there is, we can't necessarily say, okay, exposure to radiation is just going to have adverse effects. We need to, um, to, to really carefully characterize those effects and those risks. And, and, and in doing so, we need to, as carefully as we, as we can, model the, um, both the exposure to the GCR, the exposure to the heavy ions, the, those characteristics, but also the, the human subject. Now, these, these studies, we do them mostly in animal models, as you can imagine. Um, the last few years, also, uh, mostly tissue engineers. So engineers have come up and have designed some really interesting uh, tissue models to, to model uh, human tissues. And then we have to expose those models to heavy ions to mimic um, exposure to galactic cosmic rays. Now, you do that mostly by using particle accelerators, of course. So here in the United States, there's one lab, the uh, NASA Space Radiation uh, Laboratory. They make use of the particle accelerator at Brookhaven National Labs. So we go there and expose our models to, uh, to heavy ions to mimic GCR. 
So what I would, where I would like to finish is uh, by giving you some of the the considerations that we that we are continuously uh, continuously take, thinking of as we're doing these studies, as we're trying to model things as carefully as possible. So first off, we're trying to to uh, be as careful as we can modeling the biology. So the, the human subject, how do you do that with your animal models, for instance? And then secondly, how to model the GCR? That's very complex. It's very fascinating, but at the same, and important to model properly, but very complex at the same time. So first off, as far as the biology goes, so in the last few years, um, at least here in the US, th there's been quite some concern in the biomedical research field about small animal models and how reproducible are these models when they were used in, in one lab versus the other, and how well do they really translate into predicting risk or uh, disease states in, in human beings. And so this is also a concern that we need to keep in mind as we're using these animal models. So. One way by which we're trying to sort of circumvent or make this problem smaller is by using multiple uh, species and repeating some of the most critical studies in multiple animal species and try to include at least one non-rodent animal model here. And this will hopefully help in translating eventually into human subjects. Of course, we should also keep in mind that there's not only a radiation exposure, but there's a, a, a combination of a lot of conditions um, when you're out there. Um, increased levels of CO2, microgravity is a big one, and all these things will interact with the uh, radiation exposure. So eventually, once we have established what may be the risks of the um, exposure to heavy ions, we also should think about the interaction with these other factors. And then lastly, uh, to, to finish with these heavy ions, this might, might be one of the biggest, uh, most complex uh, things that we have to deal with. How do you model GCR exposure uh, properly? So GCR exposure is sort of, it's a very low dose rate, constant, um, it's a constant presence. And so over time, this accumulates. Now, this is almost, of course, impossible to, to mimic this here on Earth. On Earth, we, as we do our exposures, they're mu much more uh, higher dose rates, shorter uh, exposures, but there's just nothing we can do at, uh, about this at the moment. Um, secondly, when, um, when you're exposed to GCR, this is a combination of a lot of different heavy ions. And so far, our work has been focused mainly, mainly on one heavy ion at a time. So current work is, uh, has been done into trying to co uh, come up with exposures of what they call mixed fields. So several ions um, given at the same time, or at least within a very short period of time, to try to mimic again this combination of heavy ion exposure. And we now have seen in many animal studies that different types of heavy ions have different biological effects. So we do need to be careful about the, the combined effect of these, these different um, ions. And so that's where I'd like to finish. Thanks, Dr. Bremer. Very quick follow-up. Can you mention the organisms that you're actually studying? And, and, then, and then also, can you say a brief word about the use of biomimics? Yeah, so, so we we use mostly mouse models just from, from many reasons, but it was also some practical uh, purposes and rat models. And we're currently really trying to work with Brookhaven to make it happen to also include uh, rabbit models in our studies as a non-rodent, a little bit larger animal model, but still very, very doable to work with as far as ethics uh, um, regulations also. Um, and then uh, you mentioned omics, so I, I try to, to I could talk about it for a very long time, but I'll try to keep that short as well. So we've heard some things about omics also yesterday um, in uh, studies on on astronauts and um, cosmonauts, and we also. Um, try to include omics, proteomics, metabolomics in our um, animal studies. Now, there's, there's lots of benefits there. So you can, with a very small sample, very small tissue or plasma sample, or even urine sample, you can get a ton of data, a ton of information. 
Um, and it's very interesting to be able to, hopefully in the, few, in the coming few years, once we have collected more data, to be able to compare what's shown in human subjects with our animal as, uh, models. That would be a way to try and translate things back together again. What I would like to say there, though, is that we'd have to be very careful to correlate or to relate these omics uh, changes with actual functional changes, with physiological uh, changes, and that's what we have to keep in mind. And so we do need to have some true expert bioinformaticists, but also experts in the in the space field who can who can relate these things back together to make it um, uh, very f functional uh, type studies. Thanks, Dr. Burma. That's a very nice start to our panel. Dr. Single, would you pick it up from here? So um, I thought I would keep most of my remarks in relation to being a, a radiation physician um, and clinical trialist. So I am a radiobiologist. I have done a lot of work modeling and thinking about uh, space radiation in humans but I've also irradiated a large number of people intentionally uh, in the last 15 years and managed their side effects. I've uh, uh, had radiation-based uh, uh, novel clinical trials, experimental therapeutics, trying to exploit new things that we can get radiation to do, and I thought I'd probably attack it more from that angle. I, the first thing to echo, um, which is a good thing, is that radiation's phenomenally safe. We don't say that a lot, it's scary, but it's actually really, really fairly safe. We've, got, we've irradiated millions of people, um, hundreds and hundreds of thousands whole body radiation and bone marrow transplant, and without knowing very much about it at all. I mean, we first started using radiotherapy um, very rapidly after, after uh, uh, some of the early people burned their skin with it. We started radiating tumors with it very rapidly without knowing anything, and it went pretty well. Uh, so it's, it's, it's important to note that. There's also some experiences we've had with accidental exposures at lower dose rates. Um, the Taiwanese apartment buildings come to mind. There's 180 apartment buildings built in Taiwan in the 80s out of uh, radioactive steel. Um, uh, cobalt 60 was recycled into the steel and people got doses. There were uh, 1,100 people in a dose cohort who received four sievert of radiation, so four times the dose maximum uh, biologically adjusted dose that we would achieve on a Mars mission um, over a slightly longer period of time, but over a period of, of something in the, the decade range. They had 97% fewer cancers. They had 96% fewer uh, birth defects. They had zero leukemia lymphomas in the adults, zero. Um, so this idea that we've batted around that we don't really understand called radiation hormesis is real. Um, what we've seen from the birds that have migrated in and out of Chernobyl is that the birds that have highly activated antioxidant defense systems have lower DNA damage than any control population you'll find. So we know that it can activate in an appropriate stress response you can activate antioxidant defenses and you can protect animals against things that ought to be deadly. So, and we do it naturally. So the good news is we're built for this. We were built to de designed or, or evolved under the stress of radiation environment. We have many backup systems. So biology is working with us for a change. Um, we suspect that at least from what we know on the Earth-based side, that most of the things that we worry about probably aren't gonna happen to astronauts, but, and that is the huge caveat, where are the great unknowns? The great unknowns are in emergent behaviors of particles, so we know gamma rays, if I knew that they were gonna get their entire dose on the way to Mars with gamma rays, and that they were in a Taiwanese apartment building, <laughs> on the way there with gravity and happy food and all the other things, I would be extremely confident uh, within any reasonable mission parameter that they'd be fine. I don't know exactly what it means that it's mixed, that you could have variable dose rate exposures as the uh, GCR is in the background and you may have solar particle events ramping up, uh, giving several uh, prompt exposures. I don't know what it means to get radiation from multiple different heavy ion sources, 
But when we did most of our experiments, at, at least with solar particle events, the scariest stuff we found were when we started combining hypogravity, pseudomonas, which we know is a problem in space, uh, these you know unique infectious situations into compromised animals with some radiation. And that's where we started to see emergent stuff, and the emergent stuff was certainly concerning. Um, so I guess what I would wrap this up with Earth-based radio protection has a whole bunch of completely wrong assumptions that we know are wrong, but we make them knowingly. <laughs> and we do it because our goal is to protect a large popula population of people from a relatively well understood and known radiation source. And the penalty for shielding is almost non-existent other than finances. When you're in space, you have an unknown radiation hazard, a very small number of people, which means genetic heterogeneity can play uh, uh, a significant role, um, and for, you know we certainly see these patients. Uh, I had a patient a couple of years ago uh, with two gray whole body radiation during a transplant go into multi organ failure and die. We found a, a heterozygosity at a locus we didn't think was a problem ever. We would have sworn it was okay, and it turns out apparently it's not. So there are clear genetic heterogeneity issues among us that we don't understand and don't even know where to look. Um, and clearly the assumption that uh, everything that happens at very low dose rates is simply a pale version of things that happen at high dose rates is clearly wrong, but we don't know how to model that. Uh, animal size probably matters a lot. Rodents are small. They're short-lived. There's no such thing as a mouse year or a dog year. Um, time is the same for all of us, but we're biologically built different to withstand it. Um, you can give cancers to mice more easily. So there are all these issues that surround us um, in, in tremendous challenges. And I guess the last thing I'll share with you is a story from some of our clinical trials. Um, we have a, a clinical trial of an intraoperative protocol for patients with mesothelioma where we've seen five-year survivals where everyone else has only seen one year. Um, we still have groups of patients, however, who do very poorly, and some who do extremely well, and we don't understand why. And what we ended up going back and do, doing was using the clinical information we have to iteratively redevelop our animal model and make sure that when we put the animal model under specific circumstances or looked for specific stresses or looked for specific responses that we knew to be true in the humans, that we saw them and there were able to potentially maximize the truth of things that happen to humans, they're clearly human relevant, with the causality that you can get from an animal model. And by doing those simultaneously, um, we're able to get a lot of interesting information. And in that, um, we have exposed 10,000 people and counting to carbon ion radiation. Um, we're doing more. We've exposed probably 100,000 people to proton radiation. Um, and we have large numbers of clinical samples from these patients just sitting around waiting to look at and think about and try to integrate. And I guess I would push for the next step to be continuous and iterative development of our models to try to understand these things as well as we can. Because at the end of the day, the answer of, Doc, is it going to be okay? shouldn't be probably. Briefly, in one minute, how concerned do we need to be about solar particle events and acute effects? I, I think we need to be concerned because the scope of the solar particle events, the size of the radiation um, um, amounts that can be released are significant. I think the shielding, I will not talk about engineers because I'm not one, but I, I think that our ability to shield them is probably more limited than we'd like to believe, and we need to certainly keep them in the context exactly of, of understanding what they're going to do against the background of everything else. Um, I think like, unlikely that you're going to be caught in one of these super high dose EVAs, um, but it's certainly possible. And again, the bad news about the solar particle events is the wave front that hits you is the highest energy, fastest traveling stuff that's most deeply penetrating. So uh, certainly a concerning hazard, but uh, I think all of this stuff is manageable in a safe way that ought not to interfere with it if we do it smart. Thanks, Dr. Single. Dr. Rabin. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
We're all well aware that the radiation environment that uh, exploratory class missions will experience is going to be different than that's experienced where this International Space Station operates. Uh, NASA has estimated that astronauts on exploratory class missions lasting up to about three years will be exposed to between 20 and 30 centigrade of heavy particles and up to about 100 centigrade of protons. And while the initial thoughts within NASA and much within the space community was that this is carcinogenic and we've got to deal with that, over the last 20 years, a lot of data has accumulated indicating that exposing we use model, rat, model organisms, rats, to doses within this range can produce effects on how the brain functions and on behavior. And these effects fall into two categories. There are acute effects, which I define in terms of the three-year duration of the mission. And these acute effects can certainly affect the ability of astronauts to complete the mission requirements and get home safely. And then there are long-term degenerative effects, which will become noticeable well after the completion of the mission and may have effects on quality of life after the conclusion of the mission. The underlying mechanisms are still being evaluated, we're attempting to determine them, but it's clear that to some extent these types of radiation produce oxidative, oxidative stress, they produce neuroinflammation, and these changes initiate a cascade of events in how the CNS functions, including changes in gene expression, uh, disruption of autophagy, disruption of hippocampal neurogenesis. Um, these all th have implications for behavior, and they do produce changes in cognitive performance. Various investigators have reported a loss of spatial ability measured with the Morris water maze, lack a uh, loss of difficulty in memory, uh, changes in the, in the ability of the organism to respond to environmental, different environmental contingencies, diff problems with the psychomotor vigilance test, which is a rodent model of a human test that's used very routinely on the ISS. It's been pointed out we can't really shield against these particles. Uh, Dr. Ting's notion of uh, superconducting magnets up there is very nice, but there probably is a much better way to protect astronauts, and that is to prevent the occurrence of oxidative stress and neuroinflammation. Work has been done, for example, with vitamin E. Uh, we've used, in our experiments, blueberry and strawberry extract, which are antioxidant ions, and we've estimated that probably about 40 kilograms per astronaut of blueberry extract on a three-year Mars mission would probably provide sufi a sufficient degree of radiation protection. That would be a lot cheaper, I think, than the superconducting uh, magnet but more work is obviously going to be needed. So if I have to summarize the R studies on the effects of exposure to these types of radiation, um, we'll say that the changes in neural functioning and in behavior that are produced by exposure are characteristic of the changes in both of these endpoints that we see in aged organisms, and in fact, we would like to probably say that the primary effect is to produce accelerated aging. Uh, and as a result, it is the post-mission effects that are most likely to impact astronauts upon their return. Thank you.
Dr. Rabin, is the blueberry and or strawberry extract, is that a commercially available product? Or uh, well, we get the strawberries and the blueberries from the growers. They're, we freeze dry them uh, down to a powder, and uh, we normally have them, a commercial supplier, put them into the rat chow for the rats, but for the uh, for astronauts, I don't think that would be necessary. We might have to get the food lab involved. Okay, excellent. Uh, next, we turn to uh, Dr. Sechov. Uh, Dr. Sechov, please. Ну, я в отличие от коллег специально. Uh, uh, unlike my colleagues, uh, I have not dealt with radiation specially, but I would like to share some idea uh, and the results on research on animals. Uh, first of all, I want to agree with my colleagues that it is uh, rather impossible to uh, um, model on Earth the radiation that we have in space. Uh, uh, we have multifaceted radiation in space, uh, biological uh, effects. Um, would be different, and it is difficult to say what will be the total result of the whole range. Uh, first example, we are uh, studying organisms. Uh, we are uh, thinking how we are going to transport animal objects in space. Uh, uh, when they are in calm condition, we have uh, dry uh, uh, embryonal uh, um, cells that uh, are uh, going through a uh, dormitory period in winter, for example, with zero metabolistic uh, capabilities. After several uh, effects, after several months uh, on ISS, their, uh, uh, their uh, condition is even worse. There may be even other examples. The uh, cells that we have, uh, they have zero metabolism, received some information in space and brought it to uh, their uh, next generation. It is really a mystery to me that uh, a dry cell may be able to receive information and transmit it to next generations. Last year, we had another experiment, Cryptobios. That is a different, um, this, is, uh, this is an, an interesting insect that can be staying in a certain state. Uh, and it is not uh, scared of any uh, thermal conditions or alcohol or whatever. It will get in the water and it will survive again. So we took this. Uh, um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, fly, and we took it on um, ISS. When we looked at the genes, we saw that expression of the main genes is slowed down. And we are not um, seeing the stop of uh, the stoppage of this process that is um, uh, causing crypto bias. That is uh, a total. A uh, dry condition where water is replaced with sugar. Only 3% of water is staying in those cells. Um, how is it? Um, uh, gene, how, how is it um, explained? Uh, that is probably the effect of radiation because we do not see any destruction. Somehow the radiation is affecting those cells, and we don't know how exactly. Uh, we have a lot of questions here how to research this. Of course, we have to keep continuing. This is just an example of what we are doing. And that is a small radiation. On ISS, uh, we have a radiation that is twice as high as it is here in one month. Uh, uh, for example, for that is OK. Uh, for Bayan, that was uh, flying in 2013, um, the mice that we already had uh, for 
that is probably altogether more than a year for what we have for a human being. In mice, uh, the mice uh, keeps the same behavioral activities and habits that they had before, but they also have some new habits now that they acquired in space. Uh, this is also some kind of effect, maybe a microgravity effect plus radiation effect. We don't quite know, uh, but that is definitely an effect on their cardiovascular system oh, and brain as well. Brain is changing significantly, uh, and the expression of the gene will be different. But we don't quite know what uh, the total uh, what uh, the total result is. So next year, Bayan experiment is going to be repeated on ISS. But here we are going to be higher. We used to be 500 uh, kilometers altitude. Now it will be 1,000. Uh, and we will run the same experiments, and we will try to compare the results. In fact, I would like to say that when we talk about radiational effects in flight, we are always talking about heavy ions, heavy particles, something that we don't see, we understand how dangerous they are. But I think we are underestimating uh, small dosages, chronic small dosages uh, uh, in a space scale, not something specific, but uh, something constant, some kind of particles that we have um, the whole range of. And here, we absolutely need to run space uh, experiments. We will not be able to model it or not. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you uh, for those comments, uh, Dr. Sichov. And uh, last, we, but certainly not least, we turn to uh, academician Igor Yushikov for your uh, comments, please. Dear colleagues, uh, radiation and space uh, have always been go going hand in hand. This is how we know them and how they are going to keep going. In the history of cosmonautics and space medicine, radiation um, at some point always was stopping us at doing something or um, that was an obstacle in further exploration always. Uh, prior to Gagarin's flight, there was a concern whether uh, a man, even in a short flight, will be able to will, will, uh, acquire a large dosage of radiation, especially uh, in, during probations uh, on uh, the sun. We used to have that, um, and we calculated that on animal experiences in the past. We saw that these doses are not going to be significant. What scared us a lot, in, in a good sense scared, it was an event on May 10th of 1957. It was uh, some time before Yuri Gagarin's mission. And I want to remind you that the solar event in August of 1972 occurred during the preparation time to Apollo 17 mission. So just imagine that uh, the astronauts who were, if they were on the moon, that means they would have received a pretty large dosage at that time. So, But these events are very rare. Of course, we have to be able to forecast them, and we should have very good statistical measures or tools to do this forecasting, because as human beings, we want to keep going deeper and deeper into space, which means we will be dealing with higher dosages of radiation. Some of the figures were already presented here. And actually, I would uh, propose that uh, when we talk about radiation, we talk numbers. But a few more figures that we need to keep in mind. So on the ISS, you deal with 200 times higher level of radiation on the ISS. So 0 0.5 millisieverts per day. So if you talk X-ray, it's 0.1 millisievert. That means 180, 200 millisieverts per year. So in terms of the 
threshold figure per year. It's about 500 millisieverts. So that leads us to a conclusion that uh, the mission during the ISS missions, just like during Mir station missions, we do not expose our crew members to radiation dosages that are overly harmful. So uh, these are not the dosages that would lead to acute radiation. However, we do need to pay attention to late radiation, which is what we're studying right now. Uh, we're doing our studies on animals right now, because even when we study nuclear disasters, such as what happened in Chernobyl, we're looking at uh, animal studies and uh, information on animals as well. But, um, once again, even though we have some human data, additional modeling can be done only on animals. So we talked or we listened to a panel discussion that was very interesting, um, very engaging on the EVA. During the EVA, a cosmonaut receives the dosage of 0 0.5 millisieverts, so it's another day dose, a 24-hour dose. So in terms of radiation, the number of EVAs can equal the number of additional days in orbit. But still, we're talking about uh, not very dangerous levels. What is hazardous in this scenario? Um, that's interplanetary missions. Even if we go to the moon, that creates additional radiation risks. So it's a, the distance to the moon is about 60, uh, about 30 diameters of the Earth. So we're going to be outside um, the magnetic field of our planet. Therefore, it's not going to be protecting us anymore. And radiation on the moon is going to be two times, maybe even three times the levels of the, of the ISS, if we're looking at the average levels. Moreover, if we take into account the solar particle event, we would need to talk about radiation shelters. Radiation shelters should be at the depth of at least one meter. At least that's what the design estimates tell us. That's the depth that allows us to avoid um, a higher dosage of radiation. We would also need uh, a good communication system that would allow would, that would let us know if there is a, an upcoming solar particle event. In terms of our mission to Mars, we sometimes get scared of uh, the radiation that will be impacting our crews during this flight. However, the dosages are going to be approximately the same as the ISS. So being on Mars is not as dangerous, but getting to Mars is very uh, could be dangerous. It's, we're talking about 1.82 millisieverts, so it's three, four times as high as what we've been dealing with up to now. So when we look at the total numbers, we're talking about a pretty high dosage, which uh, approximates the career limits or maybe even exceeds it. We're talking about thousands of millisieverts. And there are different estimates that can sound more optimistic or less optimistic. But uh, 1,000 millisieverts is the career limit. So one trip to Mars, and you're done being a cosmonaut from the standpoint of radiation exposure. You would have to go through a very careful, thorough medical um, investigation. And 
According to the estimates of the Russian and the U.S. specialists, this type of dosage that we would encounter going to Mars would increase our risk by 5%. Is that a lot or not a lot? I think it is a lot, considering that our that the level of risk that we're used to working with is about 3%. So a level of risk higher than that is something we should be trying to avoid. We would need to develop a comprehensive solution to dealing with that risk. We would have to have uh, physical tools to protect us, uh, shelters, shields, radio protectors. There are different options here. There are a lot of them. A lot doesn't mean good. A lot means that uh, we're missing something really good. So when we're when we're trying to treat a disease with a with a lot of medications, that means we're missing a truly effective medicine. So Dr. Rabin um, talked before me. We are well familiar with his work in Russia. Dr. Steinberg on our side uh, works with uh, carbon ions and protons and uh, the combined effect of radiation and uh, microgravity can uh, lead to very significant changes that would be much higher um, than the effects of radiation alone. So we have to study the radiation not in isolation, but in combination with other um, space flight conditions that have an effect of hu on human body. So we need to come up with a comprehensive approach, which is something I think we're already doing in different countries. So I think we need to cooperate more closely and uh, review these issues or study these issues from the standpoint of interplanetary missions, where we would deal with the heavy particles that span the gamut of the entire periodic table. And we need to look at the effects of that on the on our cognition, on central nervous system. It's a very interesting field in, in radiobiology right now. And I know there are a lot of studies that are ongoing. And I believe that the results of the studies will be very helpful by the time we will be at the stage of the decision making about our mission to Mars. Thank you. Great. Thank you, uh, Academician Igor Ushakov. We have time for one or two quick questions from the audience before we close this out. I'll take uh, Mr. Chancellor up the back. If we could have the microphones, please. So, first question up the back. So a, a lot of the way we deduce the, the stressors, the cost of space is by setting up an analog that simulates the space environment. So I, um, Dr. Raven, this is mostly directed towards you, so I'd like to hear your comment on this, but anybody on the panel can answer it. Um, in the context of what you were saying, some of these massive cognitive deficits that are seen after exposure, how do you deduce that this is actually going to happen in the space environment where many of the analogs that are used, for instance, a recent paper that had similar results to what you were saying, um, gave them a three-year dose in three minutes. So it's a, it's a dose rate four million times actually what is seen in deep space. And it's not a whole body exposure. It's only a head exposure of a single ion. In this case, it was either carbon or titanium. So nothing about the analog to me indicates it's a space analog. It looks like it's more of an analog for a therapeutic cancer treatment and more in line with that. So how do we deduce that this is what's going to happen to astronauts when they're in space in this it's a very good question. Uh, I wish I could give you a very good answer. We don't really have a choice at this point. I would love to be able to take my animals, put them in front of the particle accelerator at a dose rate of 0.001 centigrade a day, 
and leave them in there for three years and see whether we get an effect. I can't do that. So all I have to do at this point is to expose them and just see whether there is an effect. We will, I mean, a lot of us now are starting to do fractionation experiments, which are not going to be the exact equivalent, but it will spread the dose over a longer period of time, and we will see whether that has an effect. Uh, you've got to start somewhere, and basically this is, I think, just a start. It is not going to be the complete answer. The other thing on this is we have noted that there is an interaction with age. Astronauts typically are in the late 30s or so. Those, they may be more susceptible. Again, so we're just trying to play around at this point in time and see what are possible problems. They may, in fact, not be real. But if we don't, what we've got to find out what the po potential problems are. We can then deal with them. It may not be real, but if I send up some astronauts with 40 kilograms of blueberry powder, you know, it prevents a problem that may or may not occur. I don't, does that kind of answer your question? Any more questions from the, one more here, Dr. Jones? Yeah, I have I have a question for Dr. Rabin Single and uh, Borma. So we heard this morning that the crew has in their top three radiation countermeasure development is a priority for exploration missions. And Dr. Bormer has proposed a panel of astroomics that might be relevant to try to assess the damage associated with radiation exposure. So if you had a study like that proposed and you decided to introduce a countermeasure like a antioxidant high ORAC containing extract, is that a reasonable place to start in terms of development of countermeasures for radiation defense for what's left of a very brief time on ISS? Well, I guess I'll start since I'm the one who brought the problem up. Um, I don't think there's much we can do on the ISS because the radiation doses there are not going to be significant enough to produce these effects. We know that simply because over the past 20 years, 15 years, many people have gone up, gotten some doses, and come on back down, and there have been no effects on any of our uh, endpoints. So I don't <coughs> think we can do that as a model. Um, and that, that's, so, that's, I think, what I would try to say. Any, any other I, I guess I would point out the, the big issue with omics um, in these sort of situations, especially on ISS, for example, they're extremely powerful when you have a known and well understood physiologic or clinical outcome. You know, so I'm using omics in my clinical trial to try to understand from a 50,000 foot view why the people who fail fail so badly and it doesn't work, and why does it work so well in others, and am I missing something before I drill down into mechanism? So there it's great. I can run you know, a whole immunology panel and a whole growth factor panel and really look at all of these things and generate great hypotheses that I can then test. The problem with it in a case of unclear exposure or unknown exposure without a clear marker of disease, you'll get information and it would clearly be more information than you had before, but how do you use that or how do you use that to generate hypotheses that are important to test clinically? That's really the challenge with it. And I'm afraid if it's very quick, Colonel Voss. Yep, go ahead. Thank you. Very quick. Uh, you know, radiation must be really complicated because I've heard so many briefings from so many different experts and everyone seems to have a different opinion from it is going to kill you, it's the worst thing to worry about when we go into deep space to it might help you to go into deep space. The, the question relates to our collaboration. I don't see a truly collaborative effort internationally, even nationally. Is there any group or uh, entity that is doing something to get us all together to figure out really is there a problem, what is the problem, and then what we can do about it? Because we can't go unless we know. <laughs> I think that probably just answered the question right there. 
but, but clearly needed. It, it's it's needed. Uh, you know, I don't. <laughs> Sorry, we have a, a very robust uh, radiation space element in the human research program. It's, it's the same the problem. The same problem within NASA. Same differences of opinions. Well, but we're, we're, we have uh, oversight by the NCRP, uh, and we also have oversight by the IOM, and we're coordinated as well as we can be with those, with those groups to try and, and make sure that we're focusing the efforts on areas where we need to focus those efforts. And that will have to be the last word, I apologize, other than a very quick summation. So some of the themes we heard, um, that radiation should really be looked at in terms of going back to the moon, and in terms of interplanetary uh, missions going to Mars, for example, effects can be cancer, likely not to occur during the mission, but uh, Dr. Ushakov mentioned the risk may rise to 5% versus the current 3% uh, limit that we look at when we look at our permissible exposure limits today. However, CNS effects, as mentioned by Dr. Rabin and others, DGN effects and acute effects could be mission relevant and really need to be studied uh, carefully. However, that those uh, research projects are, are challenging, they're difficult because we're using animal models by and large and we're not using dosing uh, parameters and dosing regimens that are really relevant to the chronic low doses, particularly of the GCR radiation that we experience in space. So it's very challenging to do this on Earth. We need to continue to, to try to figure this out a little better. We're hearing that omics is increasingly coming into this area, both um, the American panelists, also the Russian panelists mentioned that there is uh, omics work going on to try to do phenotypic, genotypic associations. And finally, where we left this was, there's probably, this is another area where we need to redouble our efforts in terms of collaboration. So on that note, I will close it out, Mr. Abbey, and turn it back to you. So. Okay.